Right now, Ken Klukowski, senior legal analyst and uh, second saxophonist, I believe, for uh, the Edgar Winter Band uh, touring group, uh, 2008 through 2012. And then things got really busy with Breitbart. Uh, Ken, how are you, sir? Uh, Ken, doing all right. It's a busy day in the nation's courts, but uh, as long as I can, uh, as long as I can grab an occasional glass of water and come up for air, I think I'm going to make it. Uh, yes. Well, listen. Um, you know, I suppose it's not as busy as it could be uh, with the Supreme Court deciding to take a pass on the Drake case. Um, obviously, there's still a great deal of attention uh, being paid to the court's decision, but. Uh, I would imagine if the court had decided it was going to take the case, there would be a, a flurry of activity. People would uh, be writing already prepping for their uh, their friends of the court briefs and, and whatnot. Uh, so let me just ask you, I mean, what what do you make of the court's decision not to hear this case dealing with uh, right to carry and the, uh, the, the the permissible or the the, the need clause um, in, in the state of New Jersey? Well, Cam, this is going to surprise uh, a lot of your listeners, but I'm actually slightly relieved. The issue that Drake raised is a very important issue, but there are several cases that raise that issue, and I wasn't sure that Drake was, was the best vehicle uh, to do that. Now, the fact that they relisted it twice meant they were seriously debating uh, whether or not to take the case, and then they denied it without any commentary. It may have been, and this is just speculation, but it may have been that during that time, one of the more pro-gun justices uh, had whichever of their law clerks was assigned to this, uh, kind of checking out to see what else was out there. And I would not be surprised if the fact that California Attorney General Kamala Harris Still has a motion to intervene and a petition for the Ninth Circuit to rehear the Peruta case out of California, mm -hmm. to rehear that on banc, which means instead of the three-judge panel, uh, the full court would hear it. Actually, the Ninth Circuit is so big that they just have 11 judges rehear it instead of all of them. Okay. Uh, but nonetheless, I would not be surprised if the justices were figuring that either the Peruta case is the one they would really like to hear in that regard, the one supported by the NRA and being argued by uh, by former solic uh, U.S. Solicitor General Paul Clement, whether they figured that the Peruta case is the right one to take, or that they just noticed that there are several other cases scattered across the country, uh, but that, again, there were just what we would call vehicle problems with the Drake case, which led them to say on such an important issue, this is not the way we want to address it. Okay. Um, well, that takes us to Peruta then, back to the Ninth Circuit, where uh, uh, last week the Ninth Circuit basically uh, asked the the sheriff there in San Diego County, uh, "You still not you're still not intervening, right?" Uh, and, and asked them uh, for more direction uh, on what what his involvement in this case was going to be going forward. I, I suppose that's related to Kamala Harris trying to intervene in the case. Uh, I, I would believe so, yes, that, because that is uh, that is an unusual thing for an appeals court to come at. I mean, normally they just don't comment one way or the other. You just kind of see what people do, and then it happens. Mm -hmm. Also, see, w with the Peruta case, the Ninth Circuit handed down its decision. Federal appeals are all decided by, by three judge panels, or that's the, the way 99% of them are decided. And, uh, and normally, okay, a panel decision came down. That's the end of it at the appellate level. The losing side either appeals to the U.S. Supreme Court or the case is just outright over. Here, of course, the California Attorney General is trying to shoehorn her way into the case after this panel decision. Normally, a motion like that would just be immediately and summarily denied with no further comment from the court. The fact that now it's been weeks, that that has been pending, that now they're looking for input regarding other parties implicated in the case, this really looks like the appeals court is very carefully considering whether uh, either to take Peruta on banc or just to kind of let these people in, but then finalize their judgment without en banc. But if they would let Kamala Harris in, even if they don't rehear the case, if they let her in and then just keep the panel decision, she would then have standing herself to appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court to try and take the case. So any way you look at it, it looks like the Peruta case is not yet over. And yes, I, I do believe it's, it is speculation, but I do believe that uh, that probably influenced the U.S. Supreme Court's decision not to take the Drake case. All right. Now, well, the Supreme Court did uh, issue a, uh, a big decision today in uh, the town of Greece, 
versus Galloway. Uh, you just have a, a piece I see posted at uh, Breitbart here uh, where you say this decision of holding prayer before, sectarian prayer before uh, legislative meetings, that, that you think this can have a broad impact across the country. Uh, absolutely. The, as the report I just put up said, I, I believe this is probably the biggest religious liberty win for 31 years before the U.S. Supreme Court since 1983. And uh, in real, and I should add, for full disclosure, I actually represent members of Congress uh, in this litigation, filed briefs on behalf of the U.S. representatives uh, at the Supreme Court. Uh, this is an extremely important case. Now, the idea of invocations, invocation prayers at government events, that's called legislative prayer. That's the legal term for it. It's kind of in its own category when it comes to the First Amendment. But the Supreme Court in its decision here, written by Justice Anthony Kennedy, doesn't just limit its reasoning to these invocations. It instead speaks about government should not be involved in dictating to people what they can and cannot say in prayer, that when people are speaking religiously, they should do so according to the dictates of their conscience, not with government telling them what they can and cannot say. Those concepts going to speech and to conscience are far broader than legislative prayer, and I think they are now going to show up in, uh, in dozens, if not hundreds, of lawsuits filed on all sorts of different religious liberty issues nationwide in the coming years. Oh, really? So you think the, the, the court gave some uh, very important language here today? Uh, absolutely. This, this is a very big uh, – this is a very big holding in terms of its implications for religious liberty. And the court, in doing so, also expressly called into question. It didn't overrule it, but it but it cast serious doubt on what has been the governing test for a quarter century now for cases brought under the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, that Congress cannot establish a national religion. That test has been the endorsement test, that government action touching upon faith – is unconstitutional if it gives to some reasonable observer the appearance that government is endorsing religion. A lot of what they said today was inconsistent with that endorsing with that endorsement concept. And I think it is laying the foundation for a follow up lawsuit and there's a number of them pending right now in the federal appeals courts that could try to completely upend this misbegotten standard that the Supreme Court has applied really since the 1980s, which has been at the root of much of the secularizing of American culture over the past quarter century. This is big stuff. All right, Ken. Listen, appreciate uh, your time this afternoon. Sir, look forward to talking again very soon. And uh, uh, again, still a lot of stuff out there in terms of uh, our Second Amendment issues. So we'll keep an eye on Peruta and some of these other cases out there. Thank you, Cam.